So it's great to see uh, such a sizable crowd. It's exciting. I know it's exciting for the, the kickoff to get started like this. Uh, we have a regular uh, tri-closure in my neck of the woods in North Carolina. We have the closure core team there, and we haven't got these numbers yet. So you guys, <laughs> you guys are off to a, a really rocking start. Uh, we're going to talk about radical simplicity. Maybe you read the outline, or maybe you just came because of my photo, or you know something like that. Probably neither. <laughs> um, but before we do that, um, I'm going to say a little bit about me. Uh, in particular, that's my Twitter tag. So there, now we have the uh, the information, so I can be uh, hunted down uh, on Twitter or complained about. Those of you who are like uh, live tweeting this, who want to you know uh, insult me to my five friends back home. Uh, there's your uh, there's your mechanism for doing that. Um, how many people have seen me speak on something before? So very very small number. Of you. No, not counting videos. No, no just uh, first. How many people have seen the video? Oh, okay, well, that's a, that's actually a, a pretty good number. Uh, Closure is uh, a a group that has been very powered by good videos. Rich did a lot of great videos when the language first started, and it seems to have made a real difference. So if you want to launch a language. Having a good language is probably the first thing you'd want to do, but having a good set of videos is not a bad second. Uh, we're going to talk today about software developers failing at hard problems. Uh, and I think we do a lot of this. Does anybody feel, show of hands, anybody who feels that our industry is super professionalized and we have a strong code of technical integrity and we, you know, we set out to do things and we do them? Does anybody feel like that that's where we are? No, so you can't see that on the camera, but the number of hands that went up was just mine, and I was just showing people how to raise their hands. So I don't, I don't really think that either. Uh, we spend a lot of time failing at hard problems. I'm not interested in solving simple problems. Uh, I've been writing software for a long time. I have solved simple problems in the past. Um, and at this point in my career, I want to solve hard problems. And I'm not really, as much as I would like to work with technology just because it's fun, um, I can't really be there. Right? I really want to be about... Uh, working with tools that will allow me to ship software to solve hard problems. And so uh, coming at this, uh, talking about simplicity tonight, is going to be from the perspective of how simplicity can help us to solve hard problems. And so what are some of our hard problems? Uh, one of them is that whole write once, run away thing, right? So we write applications, and after we've written them, we're kind of doomed. Right? How many people are proud of the extensibility and maintainability of large code bases that you've worked on? Right? It's a who likes who likes to work in maintenance dev? Right? It's a disaster. Right? One hand went up. That's good. Um, we also have terrible interop impedance. Right? You would think that if we had tools for abstraction, and we have lots of them, that we could take you know two small systems and make a bigger system. Uh, how often does that cost more than having written the two small systems to begin with uh, to make them fit together? And I would argue that all of these problems that I'm going to talk about here tend to be combinatorial problems. Right? So if you make your problem domain bigger, if you uh, take the number of pieces that you have to fit together and you increase that number, that it gets worse. And it probably gets worse non-linearly. Right? So if you have twice as many components to bring together, it's probably more than twice as hard. Um, also, our software is full of arbitrary limitations. Uh, one arbitrary limitation that I've been seeing um, a lot lately is downtime. Right? We have a system where the hardware and the operating system and the, the basic infrastructure is spec'd out to allow us to do X, but we can't actually do X 24-7. Right? We can do X 21-7 or 19-7 or 26. Right? So we have these systems that there's no principled reason why they can't be up, but yet they can't be up. Right? And when you dive into the details, it's like, well, you know, this particular subsystem uh, has a memory leak in it. And so it gets progressively slower uh, over the course of the day. And so we've had to install something that just reboots it, right, every second. People have worked with these. This is the kind of stuff you get into in production, right? And again, these kinds of arbitrary limitations, right, if you have a piece of software with some arbitrary limitation unrelated to its function, uh, and you compose that with other software, you get kind of like the, multiplic uh, the multiplicative effect of all those arbitrary limitations. Right? And it just gets worse and worse. Finally, we really don't have any predictability when we set out to do things, right? We say we're going to do something, and it's like you know, uh, painting the Mona Lisa every time, right? We have no idea. It's a brand new work of art, um, and it only stays a work of art, you know, until we actually put the pull out the paint, and then it, you know, turns more into you know kindergarten scribbling at that point. 
So these are the kinds of things that I'm concerned about, and I'm concerned about them on medium-sized to large systems, dealing with medium to large data, helping organizations where these things affect the bottom line. And whether that, and you know, it doesn't have to be a for-profit bottom line, but affect the bottom line. And all of that was kind of mostly framed as business problems, right? Think about these things from the point of view of the life of a dev. If you're a programmer in this world, uh, you live with code bloat, right? Does anybody have a system that has too little code? All right, doesn't happen. Uh, and you write code to fight other code, right? How much time do you spend writing code to undo the damage done by other code, right? Or to work around something that's imposed by other code. And as a result, you feel weak, right? You're approaching a problem and somebody can scribble the solution on a piece of paper, even scribble code that solves that problem in isolation, but you can't plug that solution into your system. Now, you feel weak, right? There's 17 different hot points in your system that you have to touch to plug that solution in, whereas you should only have to touch three, right? The other 14 were imposed on you by incidental complexity in the system. And you feel unfocused, right? You don't get to go to work in the morning and say, okay, we have a new hard problem that's really gonna help the business and we're gonna solve it. And you get to sort of stay focused on that until it's solved. Right? That is rarely the case. Uh, all too often, you're diverted from one thing to another, to another, to another, as emergencies pop up. Uh, and even if you're allowed to spend focused time, you don't actually get to go work in a focused place. Right? How many people have ever worked with a technology that in order to do one thing, you had to touch seven source code files? Right? Or 15 or 50, right? It's terrible. So what are we gonna do to solve it? Well, there's a lot of things going on that are not about simplicity that people have been trying lately. And I, I, this is not, a, not an exhaustive list. And as we get uh, further on, we get to questions, I'd be curious to know other things that you would put on this list. But other than uh, looking for simplicity in design, I think we've seen a lot of people looking at expressive languages. Uh, I've used the phrase low ceremony or essence versus ceremony. Different people have different uh, you know, terminology that they use here. But basically a language uh, that allows you to say one line of think in one line of code. Right, that's kind of my definition of, a, of an expressive language. And there are a lot of these out there. And so that's been good. Right? I think we've made progress there. Uh, people have tried to get more reliability out of software by insisting on testing at all levels, from the micro to the macro. And there's a lot of, um, uh, of cache to test-driven development uh, and behavior-driven development. Uh, another place that we feel a lack of flexibility, a lack of power is in the database. And of course, we have this kind of unfortunately negative uh, term for what we're doing there. Um, no one has come up with another term that is stuck better, so I'll continue to use it. You know what I'm saying. Uh, but we feel uh, a lack of flexibility fighting with uh, existing relational tools. I don't want to say fighting with the relational model, because I don't think it actually usually gets to that. It's, it's the tools, uh, not so much the underlying programming model. Uh, we've also experimented with polyglot or multi-paradigm approaches to solving problems. And I'm calling these out as separate words, because I think there's a subtle difference, or maybe it's a, a, a blunt difference, right? Polyglot is, you know, well, I'll give the naive cheerleader view. I'm gonna use a bunch of different things, because I can, right? We're gonna build this part over here out of Java, and this part over here out of C Sharp, and this part down here out of F Sharp, and this part over here out of Groovy, because we can. Um, there's more uh, sophisticated motivations for doing that. And then multi-paradigm is probably a deeper mm -hmm. thing, right? You could be polyglot and pretty much be in the same paradigm everywhere. Uh, multi-paradigm is to really say, you know what, I'm going to use F-sharp in a functional way over here because functional is really going to help me solve this problem, and I'm going to use C-sharp in an object-oriented way over here. Right? Sometimes we adopt the polyglot approach, but we use, you know, um, to, the, to the Java a programmer that knows only Java, all languages get written like Java. Right? <laughs> you teach that person you know, five other things, but they're going to write every, all the code like Java. So we've tried these things, and I'm going to come back and talk about what I think are the successes and limitations of success uh, that these approaches have had so far. But before we do that, we talk about simplicity. So people are confused about what this word means. And I would love to have a beer and talk for an hour and a half about what simplicity means and why people are confused about it. In fact, I already did that. Uh, and so there's a link. Uh, as the closing keynote, uh, keynote at the first Closure Conj, uh, I talked for an hour and a half primarily about confusion around simplicity and uh, other things, other values that people have 
that are legitimate values but have nothing to do with simplicity and trying to detangle uh, the various meanings that people uh, apply to simplicity. I don't have time to do that today, so I'm not going to. So rather than talking about all the wrong definitions of simplicity, I'm just going to talk about the right one, which is something is simple if it is not compound. Um, that is the primary and the sort of root definition uh, if you consult the dictionary. The other definitions are there as well, but this is really the important one, and it's the one that I want to talk about. And I'm going to turn things around a little bit, and rather than... I could, I could lay out the theory of this, but rather than do that, I'm going to dive straight through a series of examples. Um, two examples at the design level and one example at the code level uh, to talk about what I mean. And all of them are going to, uh, well, I think deal with familiar areas. So I'm going to talk about data serialization, data structures, uh, both from a design perspective, and then I'm going to talk about reflection uh, down at the level of implementing things in code. So first, let's talk about serialization. What kinds of things do we serialize? XML, what else? What's XML? That's not the hip one, though. Come on. JSON or you know, protocol buffers or you know, who knows what kinds of things that, that we're using for serialization. And uh, when you think about that, um, all of those things are serializations of data. But we also serialize code. Right? Code is serialized, right? It's something that gets written out somewhere, sometimes by machines and sometimes by hand. It gets read back somewhere. And, uh, and that reading back is a process that you know, validates whether it's structurally valid. Right? Even in a dynamic language, uh, there's some level of there are things you can say and things you can't say. So there, a code is definitely uh, written in a serialization format. And so let's look at some language approaches to serializing code and serializing data. So we'll start with Java. Well, so how do you serialize Java code? Well, there's this thing called the Java language spec, which lays out, it's not huge, but as language specs go, it's fairly large, that lays out all the rules of what makes valid Java code. And so if you wrote something that enforced all the rules in the language spec and said yes or no, right, it just could be red light, green light at the end, that would be a, a serialization checker for Java code. Uh, we don't normally do that, right? What do we do? We just compile it, and the compiler will tell us you know, as part of compilation, it's going to tell us uh, whether we've serialized code. Uh, what is Java's built-in approach for serializing data? Hmm? Right? I mean, so there is Java serialization. Um, it's a binary format. Uh, it imposes a lot of arbitrary limitations uh, on what you're going to be able to do. Uh, and it presumes that everyone in the universe is going to use Java. So it's easy to understand from a monopoly-seeking behavior perspective why that was Sun's first cut at it, but it really doesn't work uh, from a development perspective. Now, JavaScript has you know, the ECMA standard or whatever that describes how code is serialized in, in JavaScript. Uh, the thing that I would say about JavaScript is whether you like it more or less than Java as a language, the spec of what the rules are can be articulated in a much smaller document. Uh, and uh, the pieces in JavaScript are more composable, right? So there's more notion of all the different things can nest in all the other things uh, in JavaScript than in Java. Um, HTML doesn't really serialize code, right? HTML serializes instructions for, well, I mean, God knows it's been abused to do all kinds of things at this point, but it serializes instructions for how to draw something on the screen um, at a level of indirection. Right? It's kind of abstract instructions that then get filtered through CSS and whatever else. Um, now let's look at the serializing data side. Well, HTML is designed for serializing data. Right? It's markup. That's what it does. Uh, if you're coming from a Lisp background, you might sort of snort at that and go, oh, it's just S expressions with an ugly syntax. Right? But it is a data serialization format. And then we have this kind of cool thing that's happened in JavaScript where JavaScript discovered late in its life, well, hopefully late in its life, uh, that <laughs> there's a data serialization format called JSON hiding in JavaScript. And so now that's like a dominant way that you know, people think about doing things. Well, can you answer the question, which is more fundamental, serializing code or serializing data? I think you can. Right? I think serializing data is clearly more fundamental. Um, and in particular, um, no compiler 
can start compiling before it creates a, a representation. What do compilers make out of code? They make ASTs out of them, which means they have to deserialize them first. Data is primary, right? They have to start with some data representation and then convert it into an AST before they can actually do the real, they can do the analysis and the code generation and all that stuff. So it's clear, even just from looking at how compilers work, that serializing data is primary and serializing code is something that you could build out of serializing data, right? If you knew how to serialize data, you could build serializing code out of it. So let's add closure, and in fact, what I'm going to say about closure here applies to any Lisp, to this list. So closure starts with data structures, right? Closure is made out of data structures, like any Lisp, and then there is no additional syntax for serializing code, right? Once you know how to serialize the data structures, you know how to serialize the code. That's not to say you don't have anything else to learn, right? Sort of understanding the language is knowing the rules for interpreting how those data structures uh, acquire meaning in a code context. But it's clear that code is built out of data. And that is, that's true in any of these languages, right? Java code and JavaScript code is built out of data, right? It has to be. Um, but it's exposed to the programmer not at all or upside down. Well, what are the consequences of this? They are many, right? The first one is that between Java, JavaScript, and HTML, you know which one is the best? at separating, uh, separating serializing data and serializing code? HTML. It's actually better than the other two, right? If I want to flip a switch on an HTML page that says, I would like to evaluate the data but not execute the code, can I do that? Okay, has anyone ever hit click to turn off JavaScript in the browser? Can I acquire that separation in Java? No, I can avoid executing the code, but I can't avoid compiling it, right? I can't avoid trying to ask the compiler to do something with it other than just read it, right? There's, that's not exposed to us as an API. Uh, and getting this upside down has implications, right? Thinking about code first and then serializing data as an afterthought, getting the architecture layers reversed has serious implications. Um, look what it did to us in Java, right? I mean, what are the implications from Java? It's like a total pull your hair out, like how are we going to do this? And so you have to go to outside technologies to figure out how to serialize data. And I would say that neither XORML nor JSON have served us very well. Um, all right, they're better than Java serialization. Uh, what's the implication? Now, JavaScript comes close to getting it right. Why is it the case that in JavaScript, we are able to serendipitously discover a data serialization format late in the game? What is the chief language influence that inspired JavaScript? It's Scheme, right? You know, poor Brendan was assigned like some number of days to write JavaScript start to finish. Um, and he was like, let me take Scheme and translate it into a Java-like syntax as quickly as possible so that we can ship this. Um, as a result, JavaScript, even though it doesn't have uh, the benefits, you know, in total of being a Lisp, it does have this notion of sort of everything nests and, and has a nice composability, which means that after the fact you can discover JSON as a data serialization format, which is a good thing, but again, Getting the layers upside down, saying that JSON is a subsetted emergent property of code rather than a thing out of which you build code leads to the problem of accidental execution. How many people have ever used eval to deserialize JavaScript data on a web page? Right? Oops. Right? Why do we do that? Well, what else are you going to do? Right? You're going you're gonna, to you know, go and get Crockford or somebody's handwritten JavaScript parser that's not part of the platform that you have to add and it's maybe slow, uh, and even if you're good, right, if, even if you're disciplined, if you work at some big company that ships some big JavaScript thing, if you use JSON to serialize data, I guarantee you sooner or later someone is going to consume your data by calling eval on it, right, which is bad, right? We allow code to execute. We, you'd think we'd have learned our lesson from SQL injection and other things, not to just sort of wantonly leaving this lying out there. Now, what does this have to do with simplicity? Well, first off, you can't get your layers right in an architecture if you don't break out the simple pieces, right? If you just think of serialization at an overview level, oh, it could be code, it could be data, I'm not even really thinking about that. You're not thinking about the fact that there's two pieces. There's no way you're going to get it right. JavaScript has it backwards. Java doesn't have an answer at all. Uh, in order to get layers right, you have to actually identify the pieces to be the layers and actually get them boiled down to a small thing. Lisp does a beautiful job of this uh, on the data side. All Lisps do, 
Right? Scheme is beautiful at this. Common Lisp is beautiful at this. Right? They all solve this problem. And does this cost dollars? What's the dollar cost of having gotten this wrong? This is one of those like just sort of guesstimate thing. I would bet it's billions. Right? I would bet it's billions of dollars have been spent because we have our architecture layers inverted. Right? We think about uh, in our language design, we thought about code serialization first and didn't expose data serialization uh, as a secondary thing. So that feels like a pretty big problem. Second example is data structures. In data structures, uh, in object-oriented programming, we've been given what I would like to call the big lie. And the big lie is that there are two kinds of things, primitive values and composite references. So primitive values are the bottom things out of which we make things. So they're like, in Java, they're like ints and floats and bytes and so forth. And composite references are things like any kind of domain entity, but also programmatic entities, right? This could be, um, you know, uh, a collection, right? This could be a, a vector or something like that. But they're composite references, right, that contain subcomponents. Well, where does string go? What is a string? Well, a string is a value, right? It doesn't change. So a value is something that doesn't change, right? It doesn't, it doesn't become something else over time. That's a value. It's bedrock. It's on something on which you can build. A string is a value, but it isn't primitive. And uh, it's composite, but it's not a reference. It's not a level of indirection. Uh, I mean, there is a, a level of indirection, but not the kind of indirection that I'm talking about here. Right? So what string starts to do is identify the fact that we have, I mean, I've kind of given it away by having two words on each header. Right? If you presume that there are primitive values and composite references, you're not working with simple things. Because you can have primitive things which are not values. Values which are not primitive. Composite things which are made of primitives. Like All these things can exist in other combinations not shown here. But when you start by making this presumption, you're kind of stuck. What about java.util.date? Are dates values? Yeah, it's impossible to tell. Right? If you used a more modern implementation like Jota time, you'd know that dates are values. Dates are values. But they're not primitive, right? They're values that have value subcomponents, right? But the day, you know, March 11th, 2015, does not magically change in place and become a different day, right? Time moves forward, and it will be another day later. But that value still exists. It didn't go anywhere, right? Just like when you add 1 to 42, 42 didn't go away, right? 42 didn't turn into 43. And so the notion that one date turns into another um, despite the fact that our programs let us work that way, uh, really doesn't make sense. Uh, and the point that I'm making here is that there are two separate simple distinctions, and conflating them causes us all kinds of trouble. Value and reference is a distinction. Right? A value is the number 42. Uh, my bank account currently has $42 in it, but it might have something different in the future. That's a reference. Right? That says, you know, it's 42 now, it will be 40, it'll be 45 later if I acquire $3 later tonight. Um, and primitive composite or orthogonal. Right? Is a person a value? For most practical purposes in the systems that we build, a person is a value. Right? Or, the, or the state of a person at a single point in time is a value. Right? So here I am a person, here I am the same person later. Right? I've moved around. You might describe you know, that state is in two different states, but that's two separate values. And the key insight here is that we got primitives as values for free because it fell out of the way hardware and software worked underneath the platform that we were working on. Uh, but that's no excuse for being confused uh, about values versus references. And of course, once you break it apart, you realize that there are things in all the different quadrants. A simple value is the number one. A composite value is something that has more than one piece in it. So this is a closure map with a key of x, value of one, a key of y, and a value of two. 
a reference to something simple, enclosure, there are more, there's more than one way to make one of these. There's subtleties here that we don't need to get into now, but there's one way. That's a reference to one. This is a reference to the map that has x1 and y2 in it. These things are values. They can never change. These things are references, and they can change, but they only change atomically. Right? They go from the one state to the next, just like I go from one state to the next. Right? And this matters hugely when you start to try to model things in the real world. Because as I'm walking across this room, especially when I'm doing my little arm gesture thing, as I'm walking across this room, if you modeled me in any kind of sophistication, you might have something that was keeping track of different parts of my body. And you'd say, the whole thing is me, and here I am in one position, and here I am in another position, but maybe 500 points, coordinates describing where I am, have changed. Well, what happens when I try to change 500 things about an object in an object-oriented system? Right, the minute that I do that, um, pretty much all usability of my uh, library goes right out the window. Because if I want to change 500 things at once, then what's to stop somebody from looking at it when I've changed half of them and I haven't changed the other half? So half of me is over here and half of me is still over there. Right? What's to stop me from doing that? I can't. Right? What's the only thing I can do in a language like Java? I can lock. So the programming model of Java is that in order for me to move, reality has to be frozen so that we can catch 500 uh, individual facts up. And that locking is not just about update. It's also about perception. Right? So if Anton is looking at me, I have to freeze so that he can look at me. That's how we build systems. Right? It's amazing, but that's how we build systems. Right? If Anton is looking at me, I have to freeze so that he can look at me. And if all of you are looking at me, then my performance degrades. Does that make any sense? It's not how the world works. Right? My performance is pretty good, even if you're all looking at me. Right? Or I mean, maybe my performance is poor. Right? You can just judge that for yourself. But my performance is whatever it is, uh, regardless of whether you are looking at me or not. And all of closures, all the different quadrants here, deliver on that promise. Values deliver on that promise by their very nature. Right? They are that value. They never change. So you can stare at one for all eternity, and it will still be one. Um, the reference to the number of people staying in my hotel room is currently one. Um, but when I check out, it will go to zero. But there will never be a time at which there's 0.5 uh, or any other thing. There will be an atomic transition. This is built in across the board when you write programs in Clojure. Let's contrast this to object orientation. Well, we got this one OK. Right? This one's the kind of gimme, because it's the, the right way to model the world is actually the way that we model the underlying hardware and operating system. It actually translates well to modeling the world. So we get primitive values for free. Composite values, well, we can do this, but we typically don't. Right? So a composite value is something that's made of multiple pieces but can't be changed after it's created. So you can make this once and then it's like that. String works like this, but most things in Java don't. But you could do it by convention. I know at least one person who writes Java code with this convention. This guy named Brian Getz. Has anybody ever heard of Brian Getz? Can you imagine what motivated him to start writing code with this convention? Right? He wrote this book called Java Concurrency in Practice. And then he pondered what it's like writing programs in that world. And his conclusion was, we better work in systems where things are all immutable and have atomic transitions. What about the reference side? Well, this is where we're really in trouble in Java. Because when you don't achieve simplicity, you now have two or more ideas trying to cohabitate in the same language feature. Right? So in Java, when I have a person, if I have a class named person, does that represent a reference to something that changes over time, or does that represent a value? How would I know? How would I know today? If I told you I have this person class, what would you go do to answer my question? What's that? Yeah, you go and read the source code. That's not a very high leverage way of communicating that fact, right? if we think that fact is fundamental. 
Right? We need to have something that represents values and something else that represents references to values. And Java's trying to do too much in one place. Right? Trying to have an object instance serve both of those roles uh, isn't going to fly because there's no way for you, the programmer, to decide which thing you have. And there's no way to look at a system with 75 things in it except, again, by having rigorous convention. Now, you could fix this. So you could go down the road of fixing this. So here's how you would go down the road of fixing it. You would say, everything is immutable unless I mark it otherwise. And the way you would mark something immutable as not immutable is by an interface, because that's the way we have to mark things uh, in Java. And then those things, um, if you wanted the system to work well, those things would have only atomic transitions from one immutable thing to another, right? They would really just be references, you might call them. Um, you might make a Java class called you know, my.company.reference, and that thing would enforce atomic semantics across transitions. I've saved you the trouble. Actually, Rich Hickey saved you the trouble, right? If you go down that road, when you get to the end of that road, you're programming in closure, right? You're using all immutable values and uh, then a set of references which can be distinguished by a marker interface uh, that are the only things in the system that can be mutable. What does this have to do with simplicity? Well, where did we go wrong? We went wrong trying to do more than one thing all compounded together. And let me talk for a minute about the words compound and composite. What's the difference between a compound and a composite? Okay. For our purposes, and this is justified by the dictionary if you want to check, uh, for our purposes, a composite is something that has been composed out of other things and could be broken back down into those other things if you wanted to. Right? In Clojure, we work with composites. We try to identify simple things and uh, make those things available in programs and then compose them together to solve problems. A compound is something that has been mixed together and has more than one thing in it in an inextricable way. So that once you have you know, five things that are all being delivered together, you're stuck with all five of those things. Does it, do any of you personally or have a friend perhaps who takes a medicine and then who takes another medicine just to undo one of the side effects of the first medicine? Right? So that's an example of something being compound. Right? I have this medicine that helps me do whatever and then it also causes me to have headaches. So I now take headache medication to prevent the headaches, which is causing my liver to fall apart. So now I take you know, liver medicine. And, and in medicine, the reason that we do this Right? Do doctors do this because they think compound effects in medicines are good? No, of course not. Right? Doctors don't set out to say, you know, I'm going to treat your cancer, but the treatment for the cancer is going to you know, have this other side effect. If doctors had discovered medicines that were simple in their effects, they would deliver them. Well, doctors have somewhat of an excuse, right? Because how do they do this today? Right? Mostly it's still actually extraction from existing organics, not, uh, not genetic science to the level that we can just make things uh, to order, so they have to find things. As programmers, we don't really have such an excuse, right? We're manipulating thought stuff. So to not get down to simple things, right? Doctors can think about two different simple effects, but then they still have to find a chemical that has those two simple effects. As programmers, if we can identify two simple things and we don't separate them apart in the way we think about building systems, then shame on us. So the model for dealing with values and dealing with time that comes out of this is something called the epical time model. And so the idea is that this dotted line represents an identity, something, me, right? Me walking across the room. Here I'm standing here, there I'm standing somewhere else, there I'm standing in another place and so forth. That represents four states of me at points in time. These little things down at the bottom are people, eyeballs. These are little eyeballs watching the world. So these three observers are all looking at me at that point in time. That observer was looking at me at that point in time. Uh, and my transitions from one value to the next are by function application. So there is a pure function, right? something that takes a value and returns a value, doesn't modify the world at all. And that pure function maybe says translate the x and y axes, and so it moves me here. And then there's another pure function that moves me here. But all those functions work by taking some piece of data and returning another piece of data. Taking one value and returning another. What happens to this guy who looked at me at this point if I keep moving? That's fine, right? 
do I have to stop in this model do I have to stop moving so that that person can look at me no we're good right? I don't have to worry about that um, and so there are two things two important words that I would argue come out of this the first one is perception right in a system where you program with values and references then perception um, has no cost beyond looking right you can look at me I can look at you right that's that's easy um, it also costs nothing for you to have memory so everybody close your eyes just for a minute now remember me remember the room remember the slide now you're no longer in the room you're floating out in the galaxy somewhere and the slides are gone right you can open your eyes again now I didn't really actually take us anywhere but the important point is did your memory of the room corrode when I said we were somewhere else maybe a little are you obligated to stop remembering something you've seen because things have moved on no whose choice is that it's the perceivers choice right as a perceiver you don't impose any cost on actors in a system and I'm not using actors in the current hip trendy language sense I'm just talking about things that are doing stuff as a perceiver you don't impose any tax on actors in the system and as a perceiver you can remember and you can remember willy-nilly regardless of what's going on uh, in the system regardless of how things are changing so a little bit more about me because you invited me so I can just stand up here and talk about myself um, I got my start writing uh, code in C. It was my, my, my primary work language. I went from C to C++ as my primary work language, and then from C++ to Java, and then from Java to Ruby, and then from Ruby to Clojure. And in all of that time, I would say that the transition of, of those transitions, the one that had the most leverage, the one that made me the most improvement as a developer, was the transition from Ruby to Clojure. Right? And I say that by way of saying that this is a big step in how you think about programs, not a little step uh, in how to think about programs. And so if it doesn't feel natural to you, if you're seeing this for the first time today and you've now got you know, 40 minutes exposure to it, give or take, um, and it doesn't seem easy, it's gonna get worse. Right? This definitely takes some adjustment. But I can propose a simple thought experiment that I think you will come away with. So, so it's definitely the case that people talk about the epical time model, they see how this works, and they're like, okay, I get it, the way we model physics of reality is wrong, but I'm still absolutely befuddled how I would go back to my desk tomorrow and write high quality business software using this, right? It feels like a big change. I'm gonna propose a thought experiment that will help you understand that you're already ready for this, that you already wish that you had it. And here's my thought experiment. How many of you know any Java? So first off, so okay. Pretty much every hand in the room goes up. Now, there is a class called java.lang.string that you probably use quite a bit. Um, if you prefer objects that can mutate when you're not looking, I recommend that you take a non-trivial project and, and port it to use string buffer instead of string everywhere. If you are serious about your values, that you think that mutable objects are the way to go, then switch to using all mutable strings throughout your program and see how that works for you. And if you're using string more than you're using string buffer in your program, you'd be better off using closure. So people often, you know, when a new language comes along, people often say, okay, I want to pigeonhole this new language into, you know, where is the right problem domain where I would choose to use closure. So now I've given it to you. Any problem domain that the use of string dominates the use of string buffer is a problem domain where working with immutable values makes life infinitely easier and wouldn't it be that much easier if you just carried it on up the chain and did that with your other values as well does anybody work on a project that clearly uses a string buffer more than string there are motivating use cases for it if we have time if we have time at the end of the talk, I'll come back and talk about why string buffer exists and how that relates to closure. Because it is, uh, it is a 
it's an important thing what string buffer does. Now, there is another approach for dealing with all these problems that is quite hot right now, and it's a thing called the actor model. Right? And actors model work at a distance. Right? That's what they're for. Actors model far away. Right? I'm here, there's something over there, I send it something, maybe it's some to send something to someone else, eventually someone sends something back to me. And actors are great at that. And um, particularly as realized, you know, places like Erlang, but other places as well. Actors are really, really good at modeling distance and separation and saying, there's something over there, it needs to proceed independently of me, I want to proceed independently of it, you know, and we can communicate. And that's fine, but it is a terrible solution for the time model problem. That's not what actors are for, right? Because the time model problem, if we go back, is not about far away, what is it about? It's explicitly about near, right? The time model is about what happens near. And in particular, in the same process. Right? I'm in a process, there's something happening, and I should be allowed to look at it. Right? Actors have nothing for that. They're totally disjoint in the problems that they attack. Also, I would argue further that uh, solving the problem in the near, having a time model, is the job of the programming language. Solving the problem in the far, right? having a model for asynchronous communication with things that are known to be far away, is a library problem, not a language problem. Some languages happen to have written really good libraries for it, but it really is a library problem because I don't want to go back and recommit to a world where every single process in my complex architecture has to be written in the same language or on the same platform because it just isn't going to be that way. Right? Even if I want to be that way, even if we ship that way to begin with, I know that sooner or later I'm going to have to talk to something over there that looks different from over here. It's written in a different language. It runs on a different platform. and so. And yet the actors are being pretty deeply misunderstood. Uh, and what's going to happen is that uh, people are going to build systems with actors that try to solve a local problem by making things far away. Um, we've, we've been down this road, right, with, with sort of uh, willy-nilly use of RMI, right? You know, we're going to treat all local and all remote as if they're the same. And what's going to happen? Oh, my God. I drew every cell in my spreadsheet by making a separate RMI call to the server, and I can't figure out why the performance is not good. So people are going to build really poorly performing systems with actors because they were the hot thing. And they are a hot thing, and you should use them. right? If you need to model what they do, they are the right solution for it, but they're not a workaround for the time model, and they're not an excuse for not having a time model. So both of the examples we've done so far are examples of simplicity in design, taking something that's compound and splitting it apart. Right? Taking something that's like, you know what? Values don't have to be simple. Right? Simple and composite is one distinction. We're going to break that apart. Value and reference is another distinction. The last example, I'm going to take all the way to code, because I think it's important to go from concept to code uh, eventually. And I didn't have time to do it for all three. And so I'm going to talk about uh, Java reflection and closure reflection. And let me just start by saying that um, Java reflection epitomizes OO design. And it's piss poor. And we'll talk about why. So the backstory to this is that when we were going from closure 1.1 to closure 1.2, I was really on fire to get libraries in that made things nice for working at the REPL environment and getting started. So I was really passionate about you know, there are these, you know, library calls that are really useful when you're working interactively, and I'd like to get them pulled into the language. And one of the ones that I wanted to pull into the language is a thing called show. And what show does is it says show some object, some regular expression. And then it shows via Java reflection all the components of that object that might match that regular expression. Now, there's no rocket science here, right? There's nothing super whiz-bang about this. And, but the reason that I liked it, despite the awful textual interface, is that I'm often working on systems where I have a remote SSH login, and so all I have is a command line interface to interoperate with the system. So I can't pop a Java GUI. Right? I don't have a way to do something uh, that's richer than text. And so I went to Rich Hickey, the creator of Clojure, and I said, you know, look, 
I'd really like to add show to a new library, closure.repl, and we're going to put it into the language and we're going to ship it. Doesn't that sound great? And he said, right? oh my god, that is so nasty. No way, we're not going to do that. And I was like, well, what's the problem with it? And he said, it's not simple. And I said, what do you mean it's not simple? Look how simple that is, right? I say show, I say that. And so we started down the path of a discussion about what's wrong with reflection. And to think through this, I'm going to propose a couple of questions for you to ponder while I drink a soda. Um, the first question is, if reflection is good, then why do we need libraries like ASM? How many people are familiar with the ASM library? It's right, a library that allows you to manipulate bytecode. And it overlaps significantly uh, with what reflection does, although it does other things as well. Um, so obviously, one, one answer to why we need ASM is I said it overlaps significantly with what reflection does, but it doesn't do everything reflection does, and it does other things. Well, but even so, given that it has overlap, why doesn't ASM even call reflection? Right? If it's doing some of the same things. And then, really, what ref uh, problems does reflection solve, and who needs to consume reflection? So I want you to think about these things from, for a couple of minutes. Right? What does reflection solve, and who needs to use it? No fair searching on the internet. So let's look at the last two questions. What are, what, yeah. So, um, well, that's going to kind of give away the answers. So I'm presuming knowledge, um, right? But ASM, ASM allows you to uh, reflect against uh, bytecode, but it also allows you to emit. And so ASM is used, uh, it, it uh, reads and writes. Um, reflection uh, reads bytecodes, uh, the Java class file format, or leverage is something that does, right? We, we, in some sense, we don't have to really know that, right? But somebody reads the, the class file format down inside the JVM, and reflection uh, consumes that and can give that information to you programmatically, and it allows you to invoke, right? So reflection allows you to invoke things at runtime that you didn't know what they were, uh, and uh, ASM allows you to emit. Uh, you could also use reflection to emit because you could write a tool that used reflection to find things, and you could emit source code, and then you could compile it. So there's, there's overlap uh, between the things that they do. Who consumes these things? Well, we kind of just talked through it, right? Uh, somebody who needs to dynamically invoke Java things without having compile time knowledge of what they are needs to be a consumer of reflection. And um, a canonic example of that would be anybody who's reading and writing objects, arbitrary objects, right? They don't have a pre-baked set of objects, but they want to read and write arbitrary objects, and so they're going to reflect against them to find out what's in them uh, and manipulate them that way. Um, ASM is used uh, when people want to emit bytecode, by, but not by calling the Java compiler. Right, so Clojure uses ASM, right? Clojure uses ASM to emit bytecode. The Clojure compiler emits its bytecode by calling ASM to do it. And I suspect a lot of other uh, modern JVM languages do the same. Well, what went wrong in the design of reflection in the JDK? One, there was a very narrow consideration of who the users were, right? So when they, they said, you know, look, we need some way to, and I wasn't there, right? And if the person who wrote reflection is here, I'll punch you. Um, uh, you know, there was a very narrow consideration of what the uses were, and there was no effort to separate out into simple boxes what the different scenarios were. Right? In particular, lots of different consumers of the Java class file format would like to know things like, what methods does this class have? And what fields does this class have? And after they know, what they're going to do with it often diverges. Right? So some people knowing that are going to emit bytecodes that call that. Some people knowing that are going to make dynamic runtime calls to that. Some people knowing that are going to populate a GUI in an IDE that says, you know, here's the 12 methods that are available in this. So once we know that, um, once we have perceived, I'm going to make this perception and action distinction, right? There's a lot of commonality among the need to perceive, right? Because the facts are pretty simple, right? The facts are that there are these methods with these names, with these kinds of argument lists. Those things, I would argue, are data. There are things to be perceived and then acted on. And then there are multiple different actions that you might want to take. Having made no broad consideration of different kinds of users, there is no attempt in reflection to compose complex things out of simple things. Right? For starters, we might have said perceiving things about classes is separate from acting 
on that information. That would have been a very big, there's other things you might have wanted to do as well, but that's a really blindingly obvious one. Um, a second thing that they did uh, is returned all that information about classes as Java objects. Right? So uh, they could have just been maps. Right? They could have been uh, you know, lists of maps. It was like, okay, here's a Java array list of maps that have all the different bits in it. And if it was a list of maps, then all kinds of things could have consumed it because all kinds of code knows how to consume lists and maps. But instead, you have what I'm going to call an entity-specific language, an ESL. And DSLs may be good or bad things, but ESLs are almost certainly bad things. Right? There's an entity-specific language for finding out information about methods, fields, constructors, what have you, in Java Reflection. So you have to go up to this entity. And so I can't manipulate Java Reflection programmatically without learning a new API. Right? If there was an API that returned lists and maps, I could have manipulated it without having to learn an API. There would have been no need. And then Reflection is broken with regards to instantiation. And it's broken in two directions. I mean, this is really terrible. Uh, so the first thing is that the Reflection classes cannot be instantiated by you. So remember these poor little classes. All they do is represent data, or at least that's all they should do, right? But not only, so you can't make one, right? And so if you were somebody like somebody writing a language like Clojure, and you wanted to have Reflection give you a leg up on writing your compiler by being able to manipulate at a code level those bits, you can't because I can't make a, a field. I can't make a method. They're non-instantiable. On the flip side, they require instantiation to work. And so if you hand me a dirty, goopy jar file off the internet and tell me, hey, forensic analyst, go and tell me what's in this jar file. If I use reflection to explore that jar file, to get the fields and methods out of it, I have to actually load the classes executing code before I can do reflection. Wow, that seems really backwards, right? I need to have a way to do reflection against the class file format as data, right? It's a piece of data. There are data facts in it, like this class has these methods. But I cannot get to those facts without loading the code. Right? This is a really bad thing. But there's nothing about this that's not bog standard OO design, right? When faced with a problem, create a bunch of noun named objects with mutable state that represent each different thing in the problem space. Create a new custom API for finding out information about each of them, and then make people that want to use that learn a new custom API. Right? It's the entity-specific language idea. So what I wanted to do was implement reflection for closure in a way that addressed these weaknesses, pulled out simple parts, and allowed me to leverage existing tools including both Reflection and the ASM library, to do some of the work. And so my first cut looked like this. Rather than having one thing, Java Reflection, I pulled out five things. Right. So let's start at the most important thing. This is my icon for a protocol. Um, if you're new to cl uh, Clojure, think inter interface. Right. This is an interface. The reflector interface is an interface that can be implemented by something which reflects. So it could be the Java reflection library, or it could be ASM, or it could be something you hand write that reads the Java class file format. And this reflector interface returns data, maps and lists and strings, right? There's no interfaces on the data that's returned. It's just stuff. There's a convenience layer for invoking at the REPL. So REPL is the closure or the Lisp interactive shell world. There's more to it than that, but that's good for now. Uh, there's a special API for invoking from the REPL. There's a special set of predicates for limiting the results that come back. So instead of, you know, show had that pass in a regular expression, show me all the things that match this regular expression, let's be more general than that. Let's allow arbitrary predicates. So you could say, you know, show me only methods that have five arguments, or show me only methods that can throw I.O. exceptions. You know, those, you could ask those kinds of questions. Um, and then I wanted to have tabular output that was easy to read, but I wanted to generalize from that a little bit. So there was a REPL format interface for printing out data as a table, and the stuff coming out of here could implement that interface. So I was reasonably proud of myself. I thought this wasn't half bad. 
as a Go. So first off, it hands down beats reflection in Java. Right? It actually returns data as data. So I've already won the, I mean, I, I consider doing better than, than code that's in the core of Java is, you know, worth something. Not much. <laughs> Some people are going, nah, not really. Um, and the usage, by the way, looked, looked quite nice. It looked kind of DSL-ish like this. So I went ahead and implemented it. So it's like, describe string, give me methods named last. And named was a helper function, and there were a half dozen other helper functions, like, you know, describe something throws IO exception. Describe this, that. And you could compose more of them. And it had this nice tabular output thing, uh, which was an interface. So that was, yes? So this pluggable implementation allows you to do whatever you need to do. So if you have classes in hand and you don't care that you've loaded the classes, then this, ref this interface uh, is applied to Java Reflection, and then you can do it that way, and then you have access to things like invocation. If you don't want to do that, if you want to read things without touching them, then this can be uh, used as them. So, so the thing that solved one of Rich's many objections to this API was this guy right here. Right, but that's not the only problem, as it turns out. So I had solved a problem. I'm going to say this again later, but let me just say it now, that you're probably not going to get to simple if you implement your first design and stick with it. Right? You're almost certainly going to have to throw away your first design. And this design is the one that got thrown away. So this is nicely, this is tried to extract some nice generalities. Right, this is actually a win. This is going to survive to the final design. Uh, no other piece of it will. Right? None of the other bits here are sufficiently general, as we'll see when we go through the next iteration. Right? So um, the multiple entry points for the REPL, right, the, the, the coming in the door uh, felt busy. The explicit wiring of things together, right? So there's, there's all these kind of dotted arrows here that imply something, right, that I have to make these Right? These APIs all have to be designed to compose together. Right? This chains to this. Right? You might talk in Java about fluent interfaces. Right? We have to make some fluency happen here somehow. Um, and that requires some kind of explicit work. Um, and then we have these specialized matchers. Right? Little verbs like throws or named or things like that, uh, which are special purpose. And then we have this custom printing thing, which even though it has a printing interface right, that different people can implement, uh, steel fills kind of custom. So here's the new design. There's the reflector, which is the protocol that different things that provide reflection services can, can implement. And there's a function called reflect, which is the surface API that you use to call it. That's the whole design. Where did all the other stuff go? Well, it turns out that there's already generic wiring capability in Clojure. So there are these two macros, thread first and thread last, that allow you to take the result of an expression and thread it to the next expression and thread it to the next expression and thread it to the next expression. So there was no need for sort of uh, any kind of manual wiring of pieces together. And there's no need to make a special predicate language. Right? We already have a way to make predicates in Clojure. It's make a function that returns true or false. And so the answer here is any function you want that looks at this data uh, is an allowable predicate. And there's some idea about uh, implementing some kinds of cool predicates later in the future. And then there's another new piece, really not related to reflection at all, called print table. Guess what kind of data print table takes? Any kind. right? Print, print table takes any kind of data and prints it as a table. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be users, persons, accounts, strings, things that came back from reflection. It just doesn't matter. It works with everything. And so now, usage looks like this. Reflect on java.lang.string. If you reflect on an instance, it calls get class and then reflects against the class. This thread operator says take the result of that and pass it to that. So the thing that comes back from reflect has a key in it called members, which has all the methods and fields and stuff in it. So get the members. And then I want to filter. I want to grab the name of everything. And then I want to get all the ones that start with last. That's going to return me only the ones that start with last name. And then I'm going to pass it to print table. Now, 
there is an important point here. At a surface skim, this API is not as pretty or as, well, so this one, you might argue that this API is simpler, right? Show foo last. Or you might argue that my first, let me get, come on, stupid slow bullets. You might argue that my first cut was simpler, right? Both the original API that I set out to replace and my first cut were prettier and they were more concise. Prettiness and concision have nothing to do with being simple. What is simplicity? Not compound, right? It's building things out of uh, individual atomic pieces. And so when you look at the final result, it has an atomic piece. It reuses an atomic piece already in the language. It reuses an atomic piece already in the language. It adds a new atomic piece unrelated to the task at hand that's completely general. Now, one of the reasons that people fail at simplicity is that they're a lot more interested in something else, which is um, eloquence, expressiveness, prettiness. And so you look at this and you go, ew, right? This feels uglier than any of the past approaches. And that's okay, right? If you really hate this, what do you do? Write a macro or a function that makes this go away so you don't have to deal, it, deal with it. And if a lot of people hate it, right, if this becomes a commonly used thing, then eventually a function that wraps this up can become a part of the API. But we're going to have a bias against that for a long time. Because when you've made something out of simple components, you don't know yet what kind of simple components people are going to plug into it. Right? I don't know what direction people are going to go with the Lego blocks that have been provided. So providing a function that tells you which Lego blocks to put together feels premature. And of course, it's only one line of code for you to write a helper function that you know, um, makes this look prettier if you care. So simplicity, especially in its initial go, um, uh, often is not going to look less concise because you're going to see all the individual simple pieces that you've pulled out stitched together to solve your problem, right? Instead of a function that just says, do everything I need. If you want to make, if you had call this in 12 other places, then you can write a function that call, says, do exactly this. Right, print table of things that start with last or something like that if you need a more specific thing. So we talked about simplicity. We've looked at design problems. We've looked at a problem all the way down to the level of code. Why is this idea of simplicity radical? Right, the title of this talk is Radical Simplicity. Why isn't, should I have called it Obvious Simplicity? Duh, simplicity. Well, if you look at writing programs, we have some simple foundations on which to build programs. We have functions and logic, the relational model, the associative model of data. All of these programming models actually have mathematical foundations. Um, and I should have added um, type theory, right? Type theory. All of those things have mathematical foundations. You know what doesn't have a mathematical foundation? Object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming does not have a foundation. In the literal sense, there is no foundation. What has object-oriented programming proven good at? Um, GUI user interfaces. It's reasonably good at. I think that's the only thing that it's established. What's that? Act. Yeah, although I don't think that there's a whole lot of OO left in, in the way you think about um, actors in simulation at this point, right? I, I, it's, such a, it's such a different paradigm, I wouldn't even put it together. But the other thing I want to talk about first is the fact that OO isn't just complex, it's deliberately complex, right? OO deliberately compounds a bunch of things together and says that you can't have them in isolation. If you look at what objects give you, you've got a nice object. Objects have methods with polymorphism, with a type system, and interfaces, and namespaces, and structure, and mutation. Right? All of these things are compounded together in a tradi uh, traditional object model. Right? And you can't have any one of these things without all the others. 
Now, of course, you can use a subset of what objects can do. Right? How many people have worked in a programming language where you've identified a bunch of things in the programming language that are bad or dangerous and you just use the other part? Right? You have, I mean, of course, you have to do that. Um, but there's a huge danger in starting on a foundation that has so many pieces that might be irrelevant for a particular task at hand and saying that all this stuff is going to float around uh, and you're going to have it all at all times whether you need it or not. It's in fact so bad that I would argue that Pojo is an oxymoron. Right? The only thing Pojos look plain next to is EJBs. Right? I mean, EJBs are the most heavily overdressed thing in the universe, and POJOs are like the second most heavily overdressed thing in the universe. And so, Java is compound, complex, and complicated. I won't define the words separately, but uh, if you want to, check the dictionary, and you'll see that they all fit, and they're all different. Uh, features are delivered as compounds. The compounds contain more than you need, and as with everything else, if I build a solution to a problem that has, I'm going to call these other pieces side effects that I don't want, what happens at scale when I start combining that with other things? Sooner or later, this thing that rode along with my code that I didn't need, but I didn't have a way to get rid of, becomes a blocker somewhere else. And all that just gets worse at scale. And so all the problems that are baked into OO just snowball uh, as things get bigger. And by far the most obvious surface symptom of this, the two most obvious surface symptoms, are large unattainable code bases and code bases that are just unbelievably large for what they do. Right? You look at them and you go, I cannot believe that we have a million lines of code doing this. Right? My own personal view is that um, uh, in an expressive uh, programming language, if you ever hit 100,000 lines of code, your program would go sentient. Right? So there's no right, a million lines of code. It's just it's mind-boggling. Closure de delivers a bunch of the same things that OO delivers but as simples and composites. And so closure is built on a foundation. That foundation, in my view, includes values, which are bedrock, things that can't change. It includes pure functions, right? things that have no side effects and have no dependencies on the outside world. It includes the ability to do naked perception without uh, having to coordinate with others to do it. It includes models for identity and multiple different models for identity. And it includes uh, a capability for generic data access. So uh, data comes to you as maps and vectors and sets and not in any other way, right? There's no private languages for data. On top of that foundation, Clojure adds polymorphism and different kinds of ways of approaching type, different kinds of ways of documenting uh, data structures. And interestingly, when you add structure, you don't lose generic data access. This is a big point, right? This uh, came up in the training class that I was doing this morning, right? You start with maps and eventually you're like, okay, that was really easy to use maps for when the data had two levels of nesting and there were seven different map keywords. Now my data has 12 levels of nesting and 400 different keywords. I really wish I had good old fashioned object oriented programming again because this whole functional and values thing is starting to get pretty scary. When you go back in a closure program and layer in structure, you have a way to say this particular kind of object has these kinds of fields in it. And you can give it a name. You can say def record person. When you do that, the code that worked with persons qua maps still works. Right? This is an amazing piece of agility. Right? Because it basically says you can start every I mean, who believes in agile? Right? That's a Kool-Aid that a lot of people drink, right? If you if you believe in sort of being able to adapt to circumstances, I'm gonna start with the approach that I don't need to declare any types. And then when I get pushed into it, I will, and the code that I already wrote without any types will continue to work. That feels pretty good. So we're not going to talk about this. Uh, so other than being willfully crazy, why do we end up with things that aren't simple? I think that there are a lot of mechanics that go on in how, and politics that go on in how software get written that put us under a lot of pressure to do the wrong thing. Right? The first point of pressure that I'll make, and I don't have a great solution for this, but I'm going to point it out anyway, is lack of trust. The project that I'm currently working on we had a hard problem to solve. Um, we had a very smart person think about that hard problem for more than a week. All right, just think about it. Not write any code. Just think. And then, after having thought about it, we implemented it. We implemented the, the best approach that we could come up with. And then we tested the implementation and thought about it some more and decided we didn't like it. 
We decided it wasn't good enough. It, it met the requirements, but not as well as it could. And so we implemented again a second time. And then we tested that implementation and thought about it. And then we decided that that one was not good enough. And we wrote a third implementation. And then we tested that one, and we decided that that wasn't good enough. And we are now almost finished writing the fourth implementation, which I am, I would say, 99% confident is going to be the one we will keep. Right? Our understanding of the problem is such that I believe that even having not completed the implementation, that um, it is going to pass the functional tests and it's going to do what we want. And the reason that I mention this is having gone through this process, uh, I then thought, how often would that fly in a consulting setting? Right? I'm charging somebody multiple hundred dollars an hour, and they come up to me with a hard problem, and I say, you know what? I'm going to go think about your hard problem. I'll be on a hammock. I'll be back in a week. That's $8,000, please. <laughs> now I'm going to build a solution to your problem, and you're going to look at that solution, and you're going to say, well, <clears throat> that feels good enough. And I'm going to say, no, if you do this, I know it's going to cost you double. Right? Your maintenance costs are going to be double. So I'm going to build it again. And we're not going to go through that cycle once, but three more times, and then we're going to say, we're done. Who gets that much trust? I don't get that much trust very often. If you get that much trust, you have a great job. It's a, that's a great place to be, but it's hard to get that. So that, I think that's a huge reason, right, that we don't end up with simple things. A second reason that we don't end up with simple things is that our industry is growing explosively, right? I mean, if I went to, uh, I don't know, President Obama, and if somebody went to President Obama and said, you know what? We're going to need 40% more heart surgeons every 10 years forever. Right? 10 years from now, we're going to need 40%, or five years from now, right? We're going to need 40% more heart surgeons forever. Uh, it'd be a big problem, right? Because we couldn't train people fast enough. So we'd have a whole bunch of people trying to do heart surgery that didn't know how, and it would be a big mess. Software is growing like that, right? IT is growing explosively. We can't train people fast enough. And oh, by the way, I haven't noticed signs that this explosive industry growth is coupled with explosive salary growth. We're paid well, I mean, in general, you know, programmers are paid reasonably well, but not explosive growth, right? Not growth that would say, you know, everybody who's going to law school and medical school gets reeled back in and becomes a software developer because the money is so crazy good. And without that, the industry is simply growing faster than we have the ability to learn as individuals and as a group. A third reason, and this is all depressing, so now I'm gonna give you one that we can actually fix, right? <laughs> Here's one that you can fix. Uh, we are insensitive to pain. As programmers, when we do bad things that hurt, we often don't notice or care. And the particular problem that I'm concerned about here is that as programmers, we get our thrill fighting with complexity. Yes, we do get a thrill. <laughs> Many of us get a thrill from Emacs. Some people get a thrill from VI, but it's only 40% as good a thrill. There's only two letters. So we get a thrill from solving complex problems, but that thrill, the emotional quality of that thrill, does not seem to care whether the complex problem is a domain problem, solving problems for end users, or a software problem caused by other software that we're fighting with. And so if I spend a week adding huge value for a customer, or if I spend a week you know, slogging through the complexities of making Maven work, right? Both of those things, well, I mean, Maven's not maybe a good example because maybe we all feel that pain. But it's entirely possible to do a lot of work and wrestle with complexity and really get engaged, but still but just be sort of wallowing in the complexity instead of saying, oh my God, we have to step away from this. Um, I was talking last night and we were talking about a story about an 80 person team trying to build a shopping cart. And, and I mean, other than the team size being wrong, right, nobody felt enough to pain to go, oh my God. Right? We're doing this wrong. We have to find a new approach. This is something we can do something about. Right? We need to encourage each other to feel pain when we're doing it wrong. Or maybe inflict pain. I don't know. Maybe we could actually institute some things. The other thing that we find ourselves in a lot, and this is not entirely fixable without more trust, but we can make some progress, is that we find ourselves trapped at local maxima in the solution space. Right? And the reason for that is that we spend uh, not enough time analyzing the problem and too much time incrementally exploring the solution space. Right? I'll throw something together that kind of works, and then we'll incrementally refine from there until we get something that works pretty well. That's actually 
a fairly decent way to do easy things. I'm not convinced it's a great way to do hard things. Right? You're trying to solve a hard problem. You're trying to be innovative and really try to solve a hard problem. I don't think the best way to do it is to get something that kind of works but doesn't all the way work and then from there try to incrementally get to something that all the way works because you're going to end up trapped at a local maximum somewhere. Right? There needs to be a way to respect and make time for uh, good analysis of a problem and sort of careful thought about the problem. And if you haven't watched it, I would recommend watching uh, Rich Hickey's keynote from Closure Conj last year where he talks about problem solving, uh, where he talks about approaches to, to doing this. Now, as we come to almost wrap up, I'd like to talk about um, some of the other new things that people have been doing other than seeking simplicity and writing their code in Clojure, which is trying out expressive languages. So Clojure is an expressive language, right? It's in a language where you can say a lot uh, in a short space and you can really bend it to your will. Um, and I think expressive languages are good. I think they're good in general. Right? I think it's great for people to be trying out <coughs> people who have you know, primarily come up with Java or C Sharp to be trying out anything, whether it's F Sharp or Python or Ruby or Groovy or Scala or Clojure. It's really good uh, to be trying expressive languages. But without a paradigm shift, expressive languages are not going to solve the complexity problem. Right? What expressive languages are going to let you do is you're going to go faster and farther before you hit the wall. And that's good. Right? That's not a bad thing. Right? If, you know, if your average project you know, is able to grow to 300,000 lines of code before forward motion slows to a complete stop, and now you can get as much work done in one-tenth the lines of code, and then you can keep growing, right? So you still get to 300,000 lines of code, but you've done 10 times more work, and you did all the units of work faster. That's a great thing. So by all means, go out and adopt an expressive language. You know, throw a dart at the wall and pick one at random, and you'll be better off than not. Uh, Test-driven development and behavior-driven development. Um, it's certainly the case that um, TDD and BDD and writing more tests um, is useful as a really bottom rung of the ladder in the industry because so many people are so irresponsible with technology that you can actually run them out of the industry by saying that they have to write tests because that's too hard for them. <laughs> right? So, so I think it serves a great, I think it serves a great uh, need there. Um, I think that, and I think that there's a lot of positive good in TDD and BDD if it's taken uh, at the right level. Um, I really have to disagree with the middle letter in the acronym, right? I'm not driven by tests. I'm not driven by behaviors. I'm driven by solving problems, right? Tests and behaviors may be useful ways to help me think. They may be useful um, uh, baby steps in problem solving, but they are not problem solving. I'm not driven by that, and you shouldn't be either. Nobody should be, right? It's not enough. No SQL. Right? No SQL is a lot about seeking simplicity, wouldn't you say? Right? Because when you use a relational database, you get some good compounded in with a lot of bad, right? in a lot of cases. Right? There are some things about a relational database that are good, and there are uh, a lot of things that maybe are things that you don't want. And so you get frustrated, and you're like, you know, I want to go somewhere else. Um, I think the NoSQL movement is, um, uh, how to say this? Um, like any movement, like anything that people get excited about, it will cause a lot of pain by being misapplied by people who don't know what they're doing. I'm not going to call that a ding against anything, right? It's going to happen. It's popular. It's exciting. People are running out and doing it. People are going to use the wrong tools for the wrong problems. Some individuals are going to get hurt. It's inevitable. Um, that being said, I think overall that um, the NoSQL movement, maybe it won't end up being called this, but whatever this movement is, you know, um, uh, looking beyond relational databases as currently delivered is not halfway done yet. Right? If you look at the combinations of features and capabilities in NoSQL out there, if you tried to make a simplicity matrix, right, if you tried to identify all the different simple capabilities that you would want out of a data system, and then you put that up against you know, 20 different relational databases and NoSQL technologies, what you would quickly realize is that there are lots of quadrants that aren't represented by any actual product. Right? Quadrants that you might want to be in. And so I think that there's a ton of places out there um, for the existing NoSQL stuff to grow, and I think there are a ton of places out there uh, for other innovation to happen. I think there's work to be done. Polyglot and multi-paradigm. So 
while there is good here, I have a lot of trouble with these. Um, let me first talk about the good. So um, I'm a little bit cynical here, but I actually believe that the biggest benefit of expressive languages, TDD, and polyglot is actually the same in all cases, right? Which is forcing developers who know only one language to do at least one other thing. Right? That is, the pri that is probably the biggest single benefit from any of these. Because if you switch to an expressive language, now you have developers that have to have learned at least two. Right? And if you do TDD and BDD, then you actually have to have developers be clients of the crap that they've written. Because right? that's one of the effects. Right? It's come and go back and revisit it twice. And polyglot, obviously, if you're going to be polyglot, you're going to have two things. So there are so many developers, and this gets back to, to being underskilled and not being able to train fast enough. There are so many developers that have only learned one thing. But one of the big ancillary benefits, actually, this is a benefit to NoSQL as well. Right? They're being forced to approach data in at least one other way than the way that they've approached it. All these things um, have this benefit. Uh, I think that polyglot also has, polyglot and multi-paradigm approaches uh, have political aspects that you can't ignore. Right? If you have a team of people who are dedicated to Java and they're just not going to go anywhere, right? they'll die if you tell them to do anything else. And you have a group of other people who are you know, all hot for Groovy and you're not going to get to fire either of those groups all in toto uh, or you know, do something different, then you're going to become a polyglot shop. And if you don't support it, then you'll be the one who gets fired and somebody else will be brought in and that will become a polyglot shop. So I think that there is a, an aspect of uh, appeasing teams and working with people's strengths uh, uh, that comes into play there. I also think that uh, being multi-paradigm, um, if you looked at it in terms of investment strategy, uh, it might be better than jumping whole hog into something. Right? So instead of saying, I see this new thing and it's, it's reported to have really, really good characteristics for what I want to do, so I'm going to jump into that with both feet. Well, from an organizational perspective, it's like, well, we'll jump into that with some people's both feet. And we'll have some other people's both feet you know, stay somewhere else. Um, but the problem that I see here is that I don't think that a hodgepodge of polyglot or multi-paradigm is a good investment strategy. Right? I mean, if you, were, if you were putting together an investment portfolio, you wouldn't think, take things that had all the risky stuff and all the good stuff intertwined with each other. What would you do? You would have some stuff that was clearly in the low risk category. We will continue to do some things entirely the old way, and we're going to do some other things entirely in a novel way. So the whole sort of, um, uh, especially where you try to do multi-paradigm sort of in a language. Right? I think that that's a very uh, dangerous territory to be in. It's not a good investment strategy, right? You'd be much better off um, trying both paradigms uh, in separate projects and letting them each sort of uh, go their way uh, than trying to pull things together all in one place. So I'd like to end by saying that while learning closure and learning how to apply the ideas that I talked about today is not something that I, can, I found to be easy, it's something that anybody can do. And in particular, I want to address some concern points that you might have. The first one is that OO is not dead here. It's just been dissected. Right? So when you look at writing code in closure and you say, well, this doesn't look like OO at all, it's not that, the, that OO is dead and gone. It's that all the pieces of OO have been dissected and delivered separately in different little trays. So you have polymorphism over here and records over here and values over here and uh, you know, mutability over there. It's not gone. All the pieces are still there. Uh, and it's up to you to assemble them in a better way. The second thing is that um, with Clojure, you're going to write 10x fewer lines of code, and it's going to take you 10 times longer per line to do it. So your net time is, let's say your net time comes out even. From a business perspective, anybody who looks at the long run on software, if you write a program that is 10 times shorter, but it takes you 10 times the effort per line of code, from a business perspective, do you win or lose economically? Win. Why? Where are the life cycle costs in software? Maintenance. What is the one predictive feature of software when you look at maintenance costs? Lines of code. It is the one thing that correlates. You know which languages it correlates in? Every language that's ever been studied. Right? 
it correlates across every language that's ever been studied. Anytime anyone studies this, maintenance costs are correlated to lines of code. Now, the problem is, and I have to admit that I felt this when I started uh, working in closures, that you spend like a long time thinking about a problem in Java, and at the end of the day, you've spat out 700 lines of code and you feel manly, like, oh, I made a lot of code. And you spend like a day and a half thinking about a problem in closure, and you make a one-line change somewhere. And it's like, hmm. Right? But that one line, if that's delivering value, it's a lot better. The third thing I would say, yeah. No, I do not think it will take 10 times longer per line to read, but it will probably take more than 1x uh, the time per line to read. It might take 10x at the beginning, right, when you're learning. Uh, but I don't think it takes uh, 10x in the long run. In fact, one of the biggest benefits of having code be more expressive and concise is to get an entire idea on a screen and all the related pieces of an idea. I can't tell you the number of times that I've looked at an idea on a screen in Clojure and said, oh my god, I can't even imagine how this would be on a screen uh, in another language. And getting that all there, um, that's actually a, a benefit uh, in the speed at which you can read it. Right? But there's no doubt that the code can be dense. And then the dense code is going to be hard to read. Um, reading code that stretches across a page is hard to read in a different way. Yes? Daniel makes a very good point. Right? One of the things that happens when you write a closure program is that in your design, you will probably identify all of the mutable state in the program. And it will probably, that will be a, a list you can fit on an index card in most cases. And all the parts that are not that, you get to treat in a wholly different way. Right? They are pure functions. They're easy to reason about. They're easy to test. Uh, and that's a whole world of better. And I mean, this is a good exercise. right? Pick an existing program and just try to identify all the places where you have mutable state. And then ask, did I need to have mutable state to solve a problem there? Because if you did not need to have mutable state to solve a problem, that is a lot of incidental complexity every time it happens, right, when you, when you bring that in. Um, the third thing I want to say is that when you try to do this, take time away from the keyboard. It's actually fun to live, to be out in the world, to go for a walk. Um, I would say the number one place um, that I get coding done is while running in the woods in the nature preserve at the end of my street. You know, I, I work um, until I get frustrated about something, and then I go run five miles, and then I come back, and I have the answer to the problem. Right? Or sometimes I have an answer to a completely different problem that I was working on the week before. Um, but you need to have time away from the keyboard, because writing code, not surprisingly, is not actually about how fast you can type. Propose alternate solutions. When you're trying to design a simple solution, try to design the second best solution as well. Say, OK, if this solution was forbidden to me, what would my second best solution be? And then explain to somebody else why the first best solution is better than the second best solution. How many people design an alternate solution for everything you do? It's an interesting exercise. Right? Imagine I couldn't do that. What, would, what else would I do? And when you're doing that, enumerate the trade-offs. In particular, try to be as hostile as you can to the thing that you think you're going to do. Right? Absolutely just mutilate it. Go through and say, wow, you know, that's a terrible idea. Here's the, the 10 ways in which it's going to poison you. And you, obviously, you're not, we're not trying to bike shed. Right? You don't want to bike shed your own ideas. Uh, but, but giving your own ideas uh, rough treatment uh, is, and getting other people to give them rough treatment, if you can get someone to do it, is really good. And finally, and I have to say that I struggle with this one, get sober sleep. Right? There's, all kinds of, there's all kinds of studies that show what we're about to go do. Uh, is really not good for what we do, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, you can take sober sleep during the day. Said by a person who's been found drunk in my house more than, more than once. Um, so, to sum up, I think we're in the business of solving hard problems. And I think simplicity actually is radical. There are other values which are not radical. 
right? Convenience and automation and all kinds of other things that sometimes superficially look simple, which are not particularly radical, right? We've tried to do those for years. But simplicity actually is radical, and it's radical for good reasons. Uh, we've looked at three examples that I think have pretty deep implications. Um, you may notice that the examples that I picked are fairly foundational kind of language and platform level things, right? Serialization and data structures and reflection. Um, that's partially because we have common ground, so I, I thought that by picking those examples there would be things that people could identify with. It's also, also because the, on the consulting work that I do, I can't, by NDA, talk about the kinds of things we found like these on, simp on specific problems. Uh, but I can definitely identify um, places where we've had someone walk into a project uh, who had the right notion of simplicity and say, you ought to do this instead of that, and it saved five man months of engineering effort in a one hour meeting. How do you value that? Right? There's, it's, it's amazing. Um, how do you get paid that much for that? I haven't figured out yet. Uh, but it's amazing you know, when you do that. So I think that the examples that we have here have deep implications, but I would say that they're not, you know, they're not levels at the level of specific application problems, and those exist as well, and I can't share them with you, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we've talked about how we got here and why there are pressures against simplicity and uh, why building trust is important, although I candidly admit that I gave no advice on how to build trust. Uh, drink together, I don't know. Um, and I've talked about some things that we've tried. So other things that we've tried to do to fight with complexity, expressive languages, uh, using new kinds of databases, and, and uh, some of the good and some of the bad of that. And very briefly, we've talked about uh, seeking simplicity, right? You know, going for this uh, and what it's like to do it. Uh, and with that, uh, the other thing that I would say is that um, I work at Relevance. We are a North Carolina, US-based uh, consultancy that is passionate about solving hard problems. Relevance is the home of the Closure Core team. And if all of this sounds like your cup of tea, join us. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, we're growing 50% a year, so if we extrapolate that over a few years, within a couple of years, everybody in the room could uh, work at Relevance, so it'd be great. <laughs> so uh, uh, my name is Stuart Halloway. I know that we're already kind of at the end of time, but I would like to take a few questions while we're all together and on camera and everything before we move to the drinking and carousing. Yes? So, I mean, closure itself is dangerous in a large team situation. I'll tell you what's dangerous about large team situations. Yeah, let me repeat the question. Sorry, I knew I was supposed to do that. So the question was, um, uh, we've all been bitten by things in large team situations with Java. Clojure has tried to address some of those things in the language. And, you know, how have we at Relevance thought much about, you know, what are we going to be sad about in five or ten years when we realize, oh, now we have closure and how do we, how do we move to the next thing? Um, so... I would say first that the big problem with large teams is the word large. So, um, so there's, there's a, there is a simple uh, attack on that problem, which is just, just presume it's a bad idea. Um, but you may not be able to win that conversation anyway. Uh, I don't think, closure does not suffer from the obvious problems people worry about on large projects, right? So because it's not OO, people can't immediately find a place to hang, you know, where do I do this, where do I do that? Uh, closure has a really strong uh, notion of namespaces, which is uh, straight up superior to what I've seen in most OO languages. So in terms of scoping and organizing code, there's one spot of big advantage. Immutable state and the time model is a spot of big advantage. I don't doubt that 10 years from now, there'll be things that we're sorry about. Um, Oh yeah, I mean, I think that I think that um, the biggest thing is just not being at all idiomatic, right? Uh, uh, not using the libraries when the library already solves your problem. Um, using using identity when you don't actually have identities, right? Identity is the way that we deal with mutable state, but you could just use identity all over the place. Um, I haven't seen a lot of it, but admittedly, Clojure is a young language, and so we're in the early adopter translating into the middle adopter phase right now, and so I don't doubt that uh, you know we're going to get there. I do think that. Uh, it's actually easier to learn something that's based out of composites of simples than it is to learn something that's Baroque. And so if someone's capable of learning enough Java to do something at all, they're capable of learning closure uh, enough to do something. So I would, I would not 
by any implication that this is harder other than that it's different and we've already invested the effort in learning the other thing, right? So we've already climbed that hill. But I don't doubt that we'll find things um, that we don't like. There's certainly, uh, there are certainly design choices that you end up making sometimes that are driven by implementation details today and you know, things that could get better in the future, but you know, you're implementing in a certain way today. And so um, some of that stuff will, will probably grow into pain points over time. Um, there's nothing that's sort of floating out there that I'm like, oh crap, you know, this is a one big obvious thing, but that's probably just because we don't know yet. What's that? Yeah, so this is definitely something that people get wrong. I don't think it's that I don't think it's that big unless they are doing library design to get it wrong. Uh, in closure, uh, when you have a function that works on an object, the object comes first. Um, the object is automatically first in Java because it gets to be in a special place on the left hand side of the dot. Um, in closure, you actually have to put it there. Um, your intuition as an object-oriented programmer is already going to be to do that. The second thing, which may not be intuitive, is that anything that works on a collection, a sequence of things, that comes last. Um, and what that allows you to do is use the thread first and thread last operators to chain together operations. If you're chaining together operations on an object, it's thread first, and the object bounces from function to function and you, you know, do things. If you're chaining a bunch of operations on a collection, that's thread last, and the thread last operator bounces it. And what that saves you from doing, and people have still wanted to do this, is thread variable, right? People want to write some sort of operator that's like thread this to the second thing here and then down to the fourth thing here. And I'm like, well, by the time you're doing that, why not just write it out, right? You sort of lose the benefit of the threading operators at that point. But that is a, that's a good example, Robert, of, of something that, um, that people get wrong because they don't know the rule. Yes? So I would say let's use the word composite whenever we're describing it as a good thing. So um, compositing is fine, right? Um, uh, I wouldn't push to broaden the adoption of composite things out to the community really quickly, right? You've built a bunch of simple things. You put that out and let people use it and then see what they make. And then you take the best of the best and you maybe add that to the standard library or something eventually. So I would say, you know, don't be in a hurry, uh, you know, to do that stuff. And, and compounding, you know, I mean, sometimes you're going to find something that delivers two things at once, and you're going to go, you know what? I can never imagine wanting one of those without the other. So even though it's compound, it's not going to hurt. Um, I've been burned by thinking that, though. I mean, I, I think it's safer. If you've identified two different conceptual things that are going on, uh, to separate them out and deliver them separately. Uh, because I think you end up being surprised later that if you can identify two different things, there's probably somebody that could use one of them and not the other. Yes, in the back. So the question is, can a, can a student jump into this um, and really get started? I think they can. And I think that, you know, um, uh, we had a guy at the Closure Conj last year who was 15. Um, and he's, uh, he's, if you hang out on the, the IRC or the mailing list, he's there all the time. He's been doing it for a couple of years. There are definitely young people who can pick it up, who are picking it up on their own uh, and doing amazing things with it. Uh, that being said, um, simplicity is the one, one of the two, I would argue, pillars of Clojure's design. Um, the other is platform, right? Clojure is designed to really use the Java platform. And because of that, it gives you access to the Java platform. And because of that, there are access interop points that are not uh, stylistic, uh, stylistically good or ideal from a design perspective that you use when you have to, right? You hold your nose and go, I need to get Java to do this. Yeah. But we don't want to not have that because if we don't have that, then Clojure's not a a good general purpose replacement for Java, right? And I, you know, I made the claim that any, any program that uses string more than string buffer should be a closure program. If we're going to say that, then closure needs to be able to hold its nose and touch those things. That stuff is a pain for someone who's learning closure and doesn't know Java, right? It really is because it's like, wait a minute, aren't you going to give me an isolation level from this dirty underbelly, 
And the answer is no, we're not. Right? This is a production software language, and production software has to deal with the ugly underbelly of the platform because it's the platform that we live on. So that's a problem. It is a, it is a minus point in the column for closure as a teaching language. Um, the plus point is it's a teaching language you could go on and do production work in. Right? If, I, if, I, you know, if I were to teach my own kids a programming language, I would be really hard pressed to decide whether to use closure or scheme. You know, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I would do because of that issue. I, I would probably go with closure partially because I just have sufficient background to you know, carry them over the issues. But it's definitely a problem. And did you have a second question? So, uh, so I think that um, I'm not really a Scala expert, so I would leave it to other people at the bar uh, to talk about what Scala does. Um, I, I do think that simplicity is a, a primary value in Clojure, and I don't think it's a primary value in the other uh, JVM language communities. They have other values that they consider to be more important. Uh, I think I would be doing them a disservice to try to articulate them, but I don't think it's simplicity uh, that they're about. Yes? So closure versus list for scheme, another fight picker. So, um, so you know the reason that the reason that Rich didn't just use common Lisp, he loves common Lisp, right? He just in an interview last week said if he had to go to a desert island and didn't get to take closure with him, he would take common Lisp. Uh, but the reason that um, Rich didn't build on top of them is that two reasons really. Um, at the bottom, they have concretion, not abstraction, right? They're built on top of the concrete con cell structure, not on top of the sequence abstraction. Um, and so, really, if you look at what closure brings to Lisp, it brings the one good thing out of OO, polymorphism. Right? The one really good thing out of OO, um, and it brings it and puts it in at the bottom of Lisp and rethinks it from the ground up. The other piece that's different is that, um, that common Lisp, which is really production oriented, is not functionally oriented. Scheme is fairly functionally oriented, but is not production oriented. And so, there, it, there was not a functional production oriented Lisp out there. Um, and, and that's what Rich wanted to do. So two more questions and then we break. Yes? So the question is, um, I mentioned my Ruby background. Did you say Ruby or Groovy? Ruby. Yeah. So. And how do I feel about uh, convention over configuration, and how does that maybe tie into the notion of simplicity? I think it's a really good question. So uh, I think convention over configuration is a good thing, right? In the sense that I think a system should have reasonable defaults, right? Any kind of system should have a default. You know, if I start it like this, it's going to have a reasonable set of default behaviors, and then I should sort of elaborate from there. I think it's entirely possible to layer convenience over things that are complex. And so sometimes layering convention and configuration into a system is retrofitting that onto something that's really complex. An example of that in the closure world is Liningen, which is the tool that a lot of people use to build and package applications. Liningen doesn't do its own work. Right? It delegates that job to Maven. <clears throat> Liningen is very convenient, but I don't think anybody can call anything that builds on top of Maven simple. Right? I mean, Maven is a canonical example of non-simplicity. Right? It's a canonical example of bad design. Right, because it has a whole bunch of different p parts that are delivered I not separately, and the most important ones are kind of hidden from you, right? When you go to actually get it, right? I mean, the most important thing that Maven does is provides a standard vocabulary for describing a deployed artifact. Um, but there's like an object-oriented layer you have to get through, and there's XML. There's not just a, you know, the home page for Maven should be uh, some sort of lightweight schema document that describes deployment, and everything else should flow from that. That's the bottom. Right? And, and other tools could then target that. But it's much harder to do that. And Liningen does not target generating the POM as data. Right? It targets calling Maven's APIs to generate that. So it buys into uh, all of the broke complexity. I don't want to run down Liningen because it's awesome. And it's been a huge help uh, for getting the Clojure community going. And Phil and everybody else who've worked on that you know, deserve a big, wet, sloppy kiss when you see them. But, uh, but it's not simple. Right? It represents heroic effort to undo harm done by others. <laughs> One last question, then we'll break. Yes? Mm. 
So Daniel's question was, I'm interested in having simplicity in a browser-hosted environment. How far are we from having um, closure in closure? So, well, that's a kind of a second thing, right? So the first thing that Daniel proposed is we should have all this beautiful stuff happening in the browser, and we need closure and closure to do that. Um, and then the second thing was we could write closure in JavaScript if we had closure and closure. Um, that is all extremely interesting, and I have no comment at this time. <laughs> but it's very interesting. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, some of us are going to go out and drink, and maybe a lot of us. So I hope to see you all uh, after this. Thanks. <laughs>